Well, good evening, everyone. Good to see everyone tonight. If you would be opening your Bibles to Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9. And we left off the last time that we were studying Revelation in verse 16. But since it's been about three weeks uh, since we've had this class on Revelation, I want to back up and actually begin in verse 13 because that backs us up to the beginning of this thought. Carrie, would you lead us in prayer? Amen. What we see in this section of Revelation chapter 9, verses 13 through 21, is the sounding of the sixth trumpet. And you may remember from the last time that we were looking at this chapter, I gave you a little bit of an introduction, a little bit of information that will help better open our eyes to what is being said, what is taking place. And just kind of as a review, I want to go over some of that information with you again, just to kind of refresh your minds to what we are seeing here. In the year 53 B.C., there was a Roman general by the name of Marcus Licinius Crassus. And he took it upon himself to invade the nation of Parthia. Parthia had been an area that the Romans had not been able to conquer up to this point. The Parthians had a very successful military, one that was very strong. They were known not only for their foot soldiers, but also for a very effective cavalry unit. Well, Rome got to the position where as a result of other wars and other battles that they were involved in in other parts of the world, they were coming to a point where they were short on resources. Funds were coming up short. And you may remember in some of our previous discussions about some of these plagues and the natural disasters, things that had affected Rome prior to the announcement of the sixth trumpet, we talked about how many of the resources of the empire had been depleted in trying to fix the issues that had arisen as a result of these problems. Well, now they are facing a shortage of resources. Namely, they're facing a shortage of money. Well, the Romans believed that in the nation of Parthia that there were large deposits of gold. And they decided that they were going to go in, they were going to invade Parthia, that way they could claim that gold for Rome. And they could refill their storehouses of gold and get back to business, as we might say. Well, as the Romans, under the 
uh, the leadership of Marcus Crassus, as they went into Parthia, they got beat pretty bad. Uh, they went into battle, and they were no match for the Parthian army. In fact, as a gesture of their victory, and kind of as a, a slap in the face to the greed of the Romans, they captured Marcus Crassus, and the way that he was put to death was they poured molten gold down his throat. He was put to death. And this was a sign or a token of the greed that had brought about this defeat at the hands of the Parthians. Well, in 39 B.C., following a successful battle against the Parthians, we find that the Romans being led by Mark Antony, they made it as far as the Euphrates River. But when they got to the Euphrates, they found that that would become a line of contention between Rome and Parthia. Rome would cross the Euphrates, they would go in and they would conquer part of Parthia for a short period of time. And then Parthia would cross the Euphrates and they would conquer back their possession plus part of Roman territory. And so we find for many years there was a constant battle, a constant struggle in that part of the world. And the Euphrates River was the focal point of those battles. Well, what we're going to see whenever we look at this vision of the sixth trumpet being blown, the Euphrates River is going to be a focal point of this vision. And some of the things that we're going to see revealed in this vision are going to sound very similar to the things that took place in these battles against the Parthians. So we notice in Revelation 9, beginning in verse 13, And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar which is before God. Now this golden altar that is here is more than likely the same one that the angel in Revelation chapter 8 and verse 3 uh, describes as the prayers of the saints rising up from this altar. It talks about much incense, much smoke coming up from this altar, indicative of the many prayers that are being offered by those who are persecuted. But then as we come into 14, saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet, loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. Well, since the Euphrates River is mentioned by name, in this vision. This could suggest that the actual river is what is being mentioned here, especially whenever we see the significance of that river and that territory to some of the defeats that Rome was facing at this time. But also, being mentioned before the Calvary or the horsemen in this vision, appears to mean that this river is going to be the direction or the area from which this sixth plague or this sixth attack is going to come. Notice it says that it is coming forth from this place. Coming forth from the river Euphrates. Well, as I mentioned, the Euphrates River near the end of the first century, became a very hotly contested place. And some of the most decisive victories against Rome came at the hands of the Parthians. The Parthians afflicted a great deal of destruction upon Rome during that time. Well, the plague that we see being announced here in the sounding of this sixth trumpet appears to be constant attack, constant military attack at the hands of the Parthian kings. Now I want you to imagine what it would have been like to live in that region of the world or 
to be a Roman soldier during that time stationed at that location. You knew that attack was coming, but you never knew when it was going to strike. And any time that you gained any ground, you very quickly lost it again. It, was a, it would have been a very depressing situation. It would have been devastating to this very proud Roman army. One that up to this point had been able to conquer every other nation they came up against. But now they've found one that they can't beat. And these battles were not one that were just going to uh, happen over a few days or over a few weeks. This was something that was going to drag out over a period of time. Many conflicts, many battles were going to center around the Euphrates River, which was further going to lead to a drain on the resources of the Roman Empire. They were not going to be able to focus on other parts of their nation. They weren't going to be able to focus upon rebuilding the things that have been destroyed, as we've seen in these earthquakes and in these volcanic eruptions. They weren't going to be able to focus upon that because they were so focused upon the wars that were taking place. These battles that were arising. Now something to keep in mind. Notice that it says, loose the four angels that are bound in the great river Euphrates. Keep that in mind as we come down into verse 14. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. To the Jews in the first century, the number four indicated the physical world, this physical reality. And so more than likely, these four angels, as it describes here, are symbolic of four nations or four enemies of Rome. At the end of the first century, Parthia was not Rome's only enemy. They were not the only foe that was coming up against them. For we find that they also had the uh, Germanic tribes that were coming down out of Europe. Those that we know today as the Visigoths and the Ostrogoths. They were coming down out of Europe and they were starting to attack the northern part of the Roman Empire. And so you think about this for just a moment. They have war breaking out in the eastern part of this empire. They send their forces, they send their resources there. And now all of a sudden, battle breaks out somewhere else. And it wasn't like it is today. They weren't able to put troops on airplanes and helicopters and other ways of getting them there quickly. And between the Euphrates River and the northern border of Rome, they had mountain ranges to cross. They had large rivers they had to ford. It was a great struggle, a great trek to try to cover this territory. <coughs> well, ultimately what we find is that over the next 300 years, there were going to be a number of nations rise up and they were going to slowly begin whittling away at the possession of Rome until ultimately Rome would be reduced to little more than a city. This great empire would eventually fall and it would be this group known as the Visigoths who in the year 410 AD finally made their way into the city of Rome destroyed the city and took possession away from the Romans. But another thing that is very interesting, at least in my opinion, each one of these two nations that are coming against Rome at this point are known for two things. They're known for their horsemen and they are known for their army's use of the bow and arrow. They were very effective archers. In fact, there are some secular historians 
that say that the Parthian army, the, especially their cavalry units, were so effective with the bow and arrow that they were trained to where they could shoot the bow and arrow both forward and backward. And they could hit whatever they were aiming at in whichever direction they were shooting. And remember, all the while, they were on horseback. Now, folks, I would have enough trouble just staying on the back of a horse. <laughs> but your Native Americans, the Indians, were considered some of the best yes. cavalry in the world. Yes, absolutely they were. Bows and arrows off the back of horses. That is true. They were. But that was one of the things that brought about the decline of Rome. Because you may remember, as we talked about, the Romans were still observing older tactics of war. They were still observing these tactics of, of you march out into the field and it's hand-to-hand -hand combat, it's brutal, and whoever's the strongest is victorious. They weren't used to this concept of someone having a weapon that could reach for a couple hundred yards, if not further. They weren't used to the fact that there were weapons that could pierce their armor without that person being right there wielding it in their hand right before them. They weren't used to that. This was something new. And so ultimately this led to the erosion of Rome's power. Now, something else I want you to notice. You may remember in the last plague that we looked at, notice that it says that the Romans would be afflicted by this plague, but the Christians would not. We do not see that in reference here. And there's a very good reason for that. Because in war, innocent people get hurt. In war, it is not just those who are serving in the military who can be put in harm's way. And so there is not a guarantee here that Christians are not going to suffer as a result of this. You think if there were any Christians that were living in that region around the Euphrates River and the constant battles that were taking place, their lives would be at risk as a result of the war, as a result of this battle. But ultimately, we still see this assurance that even if they did lose their life, that heaven was going to be their home because of their faithfulness to God. Then look at verse 16. This is where we left off last week. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand. And I heard the number of them. There are certain modern translations that word this a little bit different. Literally, it's there were 200 million horsemen. Think about that. So, do you think that's meant to be taken literally? No. I shared this with you, but I want to share it again because I think it really opens our eyes to the fact that this is not intended to be literal. If you had 200 million cavalry soldiers, each one of those soldiers had to have a horse. And you figure if each one of those 200 million horses ate 10 pounds of grain a day, how much would you have to have? 2 billion pounds, and I'm rounding numbers off, 2 billion pounds of grain a day. Now, you think about this. That would be roughly 45,000 tractor trailers full of grain a day. 45,000. What about if each horse drank five gallons of water a day? Well, you would be looking at a billion gallons of water every day. That would take a very large water source. 
And you may look at this and you may say, well, they were there at the Euphrates River. That was a very large river, a very large water source. Well, think about this. In order to line up each one of those horses at the river to get that drink of water, it would take 200 miles of riverbank. Think about an army that large. It's unfathomable. Therefore, it's not something that is intended to be literal. Another thing, notice we've only taken care of the horses. You also have to take care of the soldiers. It's not literal. What this number is symbolic of, it's symbolic of a sufficient number to carry out God's will. However many it took, that's how many it was that were there. A sufficient number to carry out punishment against Rome. All right, verse 17. <clears throat> and thus I saw the horses in the vision, and them that sat on them having breastplates of fire, and of jacinth and brimstone, and the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. Now remember, a large factor that made not only the Parthians, but also the Visigoths and the Ostrogoths such imposing foes to Rome was their effective horsemanship their abilities to wage war on horseback. The Parthians, and I've already shared a little bit of this with you tonight, but they had so perfected this, this horseback warfare that they were considered an opposing foe whether they were going forward or whether they were in retreat because they were so effective at using the weapons that they had. But also, these soldiers had developed a type of armor that they were able to wear on horseback. And that armor was no match for the Roman soldiers. With the weapons that they had, their swords and their spears, it was no match whenever they had this armor that they were wearing. And not only would the soldiers have armor on, but their horses would have this armor on as well. And so whenever we look at what this is talking about, when it says, I saw the horses had breastplates of fire and brimstone, and the heads of the horses were like lions, they look up, and what they see coming toward them don't really look like a man and a horse. It doesn't really look like a soldier that's coming toward them because of all the armor, because of the way that they are pictured. But not only that, when we look at what is symbolically meant by these things, we see the ferocity. We see the hatred. We see the strength. We see the destruction that was coming at the hands of this army. But also, starting in the year 429 B.C., the Parthian army learned from the Spartans how to make flaming arrows that would not go out after being shot from a bow. And so you take that in mind, and they see this army coming toward them, they see all this armor. They see this great strength. And then suddenly fire starts coming forth from them in the form of these flaming arrows. And those arrows strike and they light on fire whatever it is that they strike. And the substance that is made of a mixture of sulfur, pitch, and charcoal that is packed into a tar-like substance once it's on fire, it does not go out until it burns off. And so they were very successful. And this was all taking place during the time Revelation was being written. These battles were things that they were already facing. 
these struggles. Any questions or comments? I know we've talked about a lot of different things. Everybody's been pretty quiet tonight. Any questions or comments at all? Okay, look at verse 18. By these three was the third part of men killed by the fire, by the smoke, and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouth. Typically in the Bible, when we read of these three things, fire, smoke, and brimstone, what is it typically indicative of? The wrath of God. The wrath of God. Or divine judgment. In Genesis 19 and verse 24, what rained down from heaven upon Sodom and Gomorrah? Fire and brimstone. What are we told that that the eternal place of destruction known as hell, what is that made up of? A lake of fire that burneth, or a lake that burneth with fire and brimstone. It's indicative of God's wrath or God's judgment. Now, whether all of this is intended to be literal or whether some of this is literal and some of it's figurative, we can look back at the Old Testament. And we find passages in the Old Testament where we plainly see some of these things being used, some of these forms of weapons being used, fire being used as a weapon. And we can easily infer that this could be literally talking about a form of battle a form of a weapon that is being used because we know that it was something that was used in the day. And we know that countless thousands, if not millions of people, perished as a result of it. But whether it is intended to be literal or whether it is intended to be 100% figurative in this description, the meaning of it is obvious. And that is that the consequences of this war, the consequences of battle. And folks, really when it comes down to it, are the consequences of war generally positive or negative? They're generally negative. Literally what we see here is that there were going to be terrible consequences that were going to come upon Rome as a result of these attacks. Great destruction. Notice it uses this illustration that we've seen used a couple of other times. This fact about it striking a third part of men. We talked about the fact that this is saying that this was not going to impact the entire empire. Well, that war, those battles that were taking place, this was something that was along the eastern border. And so those cities along the Mediterranean, those cities in the southern part of the empire, they were away from the battle. They weren't being affected by it. But you may remember, as we've already seen in some of these other plagues, who were the ones that were most impacted by the earthquakes and the volcanoes? The ones along the Mediterranean and the ones in the southern part of the empire. So we see every person in the Roman Empire, is going to suffer by the time it's all said and done. They're all going to suffer in some way. But it's not all coming at once. And it's not all coming in the same way. Some of it's through natural disasters. Some of it is through physical plagues, as we talked about earlier on. Some of it is now going to be as a result of war but they're all going to be impacted in some way. But notice he says that this war, this battle, is going to impact a large portion of the empire. He uses the example of a third. Verse 19, For their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails were like unto serpents and had heads and with them They do hurt. Now, two times now, it's been mentioned that these plagues are coming forth from the mouths and the tails 
of these horses. Now, do horses literally breathe smoke, fire, and brimstone? No. So we know that that is not literally what this is saying. But horses who have riders that can shoot flaming arrows from the front as well as from the back. Makes sense, doesn't it? When we look at this from a historical perspective, and we see the things that were going on, it would appear to those that were seeing this that those arrows were coming forth from the mouth and the tail of the horse. but literally it was coming from the soldier. Shooting from the front and from the rear. But the image that we see here is more of terror, panic, and loss of life than it is of literal fire, smoke, and brimstone. Imagine being one of those Roman soldiers standing out there on the field of battle waiting for hand-to-hand combat and all of a sudden the Parthian army appears. The horse, the rider, covered head to toe in impenetrable armor. And then all of a sudden, those flaming arrows begin coming through the air. Panic. Terror. They can't run away fast enough. They can't retreat. They can't run faster than the horses. This was a devastating time. But as I've said several times as we've been looking at the book of Revelation, rather than focusing so much upon each of these intricate details and each of these symbols that we see, let's focus upon the message, focus upon the big picture of what we're seeing in each one of these visions. And ultimately, what we see here, we focus on the result. We focus on the objective. And that was to punish Rome. Remember, as that book was being opened, it was being revealed the things that God was going to do to bring relief to persecuted Christians. And the way that that was being done was through these plagues, through these natural disasters, through these wars. The overall picture is that God is going to care for His people. God heard their prayers, and He is now going to answer their prayers, and He is going to do that by dealing Rome a decisive defeat. Showing them that they're not really as strong as they thought they were. Remember, they were a very proud nation. They thought that they could not be defeated. And in many ways, they were the strongest nation on earth at that time. But they were not stronger than God. And God allowed these other nations to rise in power to the point that they were able to bring this punishment against Rome. Verse 20. We're out of time. All right, Lord willing, next Wednesday night we'll pick up in chapter 9 and verse 20. Think about what's happening in our country today. It's declining in the real strength throughout the world. And China's increasing. God could have the same thing in mind for us. I'm not saying, but you know, you just look at history. God's always in charge. And he's used some awful bad people to accomplish his purposes.